Today's conference is sponsored by Marathon Digital Holdings. They are one of the largest, most energy efficient, and most technologically advanced Bitcoin mining companies in the world, as well as one of the largest holders of Bitcoin among publicly traded companies in all of North America. They differentiate by investing in the most advanced technologies and leveraging innovative techniques to convert energy into economic value while helping keep Bitcoin's ledger up to date and secure one block at a time. Go check out Marathon at MARA.com today. This conference is also sponsored by Iris Energy. They build, own, and operate data centers and electrical infrastructure to mine Bitcoin. They've been mining it using the right kind of energy since 2019, and they introduced sustainably mined Bitcoin all by Iris Energy. They use renewable energy to power computing infrastructure. That computing infrastructure provides network security support to a Bitcoin mining pool, which then delivers daily Bitcoin and transaction fees to Iris Energy, and which that is monetized, going from Bitcoin to cash. Go check out Iris Energy today at irisenergy.co. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Build or Die, the Bitcoin Mining Conference. I'm super excited to have you join us today. In the following conversations, we have some of the top experts and executives in Bitcoin mining. They're going to be telling us all about the market, about what they see in the cyclicality of Bitcoin's price, how miners are reacting, what some of the good strategies have been, what some of the bad strategies have been, and what differentiates their company from everyone else. These people have been working on the industry for literally years. They are some of the smartest, hardest working people in all of Bitcoin mining, and they lead some of the most important companies. So I'm very excited to talk to each one of them and bring all this information and education to each one of you. First up, we have Daniel Roberts. He's the co-founder and co-CEO of Iris Energy. Daniel and his team have a social focus, but they also are looking to have renewable energy and focus on profitability. Here is Daniel Roberts. Let's bring him up onto stage. All right, Daniel, I thought a great place for us to start this conversation is one of the claims to fame for your business is that you all have used 100% renewable energy since day one. Obviously, energy consumption and the type of energy has become this huge global topic in Bitcoin mining. But talk a little bit as to why you all thought not only one, that was an important thing to do from the start, but why you've remained so committed to it over time. Absolutely. Uh, it has been a foundation of our business, but it isn't just 100% renewable energy. It's a lot more than that. And to give you some context, we've a lot of us have come from traditional infrastructure energy businesses, developed gigawatts of renewable energy projects, raised billions of dollars of institutional funds into those types of projects. And we know that the tailwinds globally around renewable energy are there and it's going to come to Bitcoin mining and it has. But for us, that's not enough. We never want to be accused of pushing up power prices to mums and dads, taking power away from other users. We can argue till the cows come home about whether that's right or wrong in terms of the scrutiny of Bitcoin mining, but it is the reality. So from day one, we said we need that social license to operate. So our focus has been not just 100% renewable energy, but only entering energy markets where the introduction of our load is solving energy market problems. And that persists in the two markets we operate today, being Texas and British Columbia in Canada. Talk a little bit more about this social license to operate. It's a very kind of unique phrase. And what you're talking about here when you say, you know, not taking power away from people, not driving the price up, is essentially you are looking to go into markets or communities and be a net positive, actually improve the situation, not degradate it for those that are already there. How do you measure whether you're actually doing that? And then what are you actually doing in terms of uh, ensuring that you're able to do it before you go into the market? Absolutely. And this is leveraging a narrative that, well, I guess countering a narrative that's persisted in Bitcoin early, where you've got these people coming into local towns, stealing the power, running away, leaving temporary stuck structures behind. Um, and we said, look, we've got to change this. It's got to be done differently. So from an energy market perspective, we make sure that we're providing valuable services and valuable load in a way that stabilizes those markets. And I can get into that. But it goes all the way through to local communities. So grants programs, sponsoring local football teams, local fire brigades. You know, a couple of months ago, we gave out milk vouchers in a local town in Mackenzie. Like it, it just covers absolutely everything. So in terms of how you measure it, you can. Like you speak to these people all the way from local communities to local councils, provincial level. And then obviously you keep an eye on what's happening at a federal level. 
Um, but increasingly importantly for us, it's all about that grassroots within the hearts and minds of local communities and actually helping them because a lot of the regional communities in these Western markets have been decimated by the closure of manufacturing and general industry over the last 10 to 20 years. So the opportunity to come back into those markets, rehire local people like we've done in British Columbia, retrain them from the old pulp and paper mills where they were active, give them jobs, give them employment, local taxes, et cetera. Like it's quite rewarding. Talk a little bit about your strategy in terms of the data centers themselves. So we've talked about kind of uh, renewables being 100%, being this net positive in these communities, but also where you put the miners is very different than many other companies. You all are building kind of proper data centers. What exactly does that mean when it's a proper data center? And why has that been the strategy? Absolutely. And again, that dovetails nicely into the community strategy. It has often been commented that people like the fact that we are building multi-decade infrastructure, not rocking up with temporary structures, shipping containers, sea cans, where at least the perception is that you're not necessarily here to stay. But deeper than that, it's been this fundamental belief that we're on the cusp of this fourth industrial revolution. In fact, we're well into it by now. And what that creates is this exponential demand for computing power and energy intensive compute. What the choke point is, is the real world actually building enough infrastructure, getting enough renewable energy under a socially acceptable manner to deliver those services into that digital exponential world that we're now really starting to take off. Now, Bitcoin mining is really easy to see that yeah you know, you've got discrete profitability every 10 minutes you've got a share of that block gross profit yeah you can see the numbers but as we've started to see with the high performance computing narrative start to take off over the last six months chat gpt ai machine learning these large language models this is exactly the way we've positioned our business we signed an mou with dell computing over three years ago to start testing and developing data center solutions for these energy intense compute applications. And to be really clear on what these are, these are applications that require raw computing power. They're very different to the hyperscalers and these capital city data centers that are optimized more for live time cloud computing, really low latency, really high responsiveness, reliability. But the coming wave of all this machine learning, this high performance compute, needs to prioritize access to low cost renewable energy built in fit for purpose facilities rather than the bells and whistles of these traditional capital city data centers. One analogy that I've used in the past for our business is a bit to do with farming. We're farmers. Where in farming, your key input, your key driver is hydrology, the water you have available. You then take that water, you take your land, you convert that into valuable crops and you can pivot from one crop to another. In this industry, the water is this low cost renewable energy. That's the lifeblood of our business. How we choose to monetize that in various different pathways into this computing exponential age that we're embarking on is a journey that will continue to go on. Talk a little bit about the energy side. So we talked about renewables, but as you all think about building these data centers, how do you do site selection? And is there any desire or plan to do true vertical integration where you all would eventually go buy large infrastructure, you know, energy, uh, whether they're plants or other types of power generation type facilities? Yeah, so site selection, it's a bit like the flip side of the same coin when we've been developing wind and solar projects in the past. So instead of finding the best sites to build wind and solar projects, you're now finding the best sites to capture that excess low cost renewable energy and monetize it um, into these computing applications. So from a high level filter for site selection, it's looking at geographies. So we'll only do Western institutional bankable markets. We'll only look at 100% renewables. We will only look at markets where we can solve a problem so that's more the macro. You identify the jurisdictions, the provinces, the states, et cetera. You then need to find a site. So it's going back to those the work that we've done over the last 20 years, which is door knocking local farmers, speaking to local utilities, finding areas on the network that have capacity, have scope for us to connect and take low cost excess renewables. You then sign an option agreement with a local farmer go through the connection agreement planning, et cetera. So for the last five years, we have been doing this globally. Yes, we've got those four sites that everyone knows about, the three in British Columbia, 
the one in Texas. Texas has got 600 megawatts of, of capacity alone, but we've got gigawatts of additional projects globally. This has been a land grab for the last five years to lock up that low cost excess renewables. And again, it's the flip side of the renewables development coin that we did firsthand going back to the mid 2000s in Europe, working for Macquarie and Australian Investment Bank. It was the race to lock up all these best sites for wind and solar. It's a land grab. And it's something that we feel like we've been ahead of the curve on. Talk a little bit about the migration of global hash rate to those kind of Western bankable uh, jurisdictions. We obviously saw China in 2021 kick out a bunch of miners uh, and hash rate kind of spread throughout the world. But the United States uh, specifically seemed to be a big winner, about 30 to 35 percent of all global hash rate, depending on the estimate is there. The state of Texas was even bigger winner, where they have now 10% or more of global hash rate. You all have a facility in Texas. And so, you know, is this a net positive that we're getting some degree of concentration in those kind of Western markets where there is institutional capital, there's kind of rule of law, there's predictability? Or do you foresee potentially if we go too far in that direction, that centralization in one geography could actually become a problem? Mm. Look, this is something we've seen in other sectors, in other mining related industries. If you look at gold, right, and you look at the top five gold producing nations by cost per Bitcoin, uh, per, I almost said Bitcoin, per gold ounce mined, it's a very different set of, com of countries to the top five gold producers, you know, the US, Australia, Canada, South Africa, et cetera. And the reason for that is one, free markets tend to win out in liberal democracies where people can go and feel free to build businesses unimpeded by the state, that tends to provide a better, faster way to build out capacity. Secondly, institutional money recognises geographic political risk and the money flows into those geographies. So for years we were batting away, you guys will never succeed, you'll never be able to compete with China at two cents or Iran with two, two and a half cents or Paraguay, whatever the countries were. We said, you know what? We're taking a long-term view with everything that we do. Long-term, we believe our focus on low-cost renewables in Western geographies will pay out for a variety of reasons, including that. That is exactly what we're seeing and is a trend that will only accelerate. Now, to your question around whether you can get overly con concentrated in these geographies, I think the simple answer is we're so far beyond that with the Bitcoin network. Like there is so much hash power, there's so many incentives and it kind of dovetails into this question that people always ask about a 51% attack. A 51% attack is nonsense. Like when you play out what you can actually do if you ever got the majority of the hash rate, it's next to nothing. You can literally censor your own transactions or try and double spend it and fleece a, an exchange. Like there's nothing you can do to the network. So to say that Texas is 10, maybe it might be 20, 25% of the global hash rate in the future, like that is so far from a concern. Talk about capital markets and kind of the response that you all have seen from investors. Are these investors who are Bitcoin specific? Are they energy investors? Are they infrastructure investors? Are they just whoever you guys can find that are interested with capital and looking to make money? What are you seeing there in the capital markets? It's evolving and it goes up and down. Like it has changed with the sectors. On the When Bitcoin's rallying, everybody's interested. Everyone wants to have a conversation. Our IPO was the first one on the NASDAQ led by bulge bracket banks, JP Morgan, Citi, Canaccord, et cetera, and six others. Uh, the majority of our IPO was institutional capital, everything from generalists to energy funds, et cetera. Now, as the tide's gone out on the sector a bit more broadly, it's been harder to get traction with those funds. Energy funds tend to like the proposition because they view it as a spread. You're selling your Bitcoin for X, you're buying it. For why and it's a business that doesn't hold on to bitcoin long term and it's a cash flow base they can see that we're just manufacturing widgets and the widgets have got a gross margin and it's an attractive way to monetize that energy look over time it's definitely a harder market at the moment to crack institutional capital at least from an equity perspective we're seeing a lot of interest over the last four months come back into the market from kind of creative solutions, so non-equity, hybrid debt, et cetera, which is encouraging. Cost of capital is still really high, but equally when you're deploying this capital um, into really profitable ventures at an underlying project level into these mining operations, you can tolerate a high cost of capital to some extent. 
Talk about uh, the difference that you all are seeing in the regulatory environments. You have facilities in uh, the United States. You have facilities in Canada. Uh, I'm assuming that you've looked in other parts of the world as well. How do you use the regulatory frameworks to underwrite where the site selection will occur? Yeah, look, as I said, we've got sites um, in other parts of the world um, quite well spread, actually. Look, it, it's a balance, right, because this is an evolution that everyone's going on, um, regulators, the politics, social acceptance, etc. So it's very easy to knee jerk, but we just try and step back. And so, you know what, eventually the truth wins. If you fundamentally are delivering good services, you're rehiring local community workers, you're genuinely delivering benefits into an energy market, then deal with the noise, just block it out, address the fundamentals and piece by piece, educate people and keep doing the right thing. Now, you know, we've seen what's happening at a federal level in the US, that mining tax got proposed, got withdrawn. We've seen different markets say, you know, Bitcoin miners are using too much energy. And I think to some extent they're valid, right? If you've got all these reserves in renewable energy, you don't want to see some new industry come in and just swallow it all up at the expense of potential innovation and development. But equally, it's just taking people on that ride, explaining our perspective and going on the journey collectively. When you start to look at the United States kind of mining industry, how much of uh, the competition from the state or local level is occurring today? Are you getting phone calls from people who run these grids and they're saying, hey, we saw what's happened in Texas and the miners' ability to balance these grids. Uh, we want to give you subsidies. We want to get you here. We want to give you tax breaks. We want to somehow incentivize you to come and build your next facility at our state or our local level. Uh, or are we still a ways off from those types of phone calls and those types of incentives? I think we're a little way off from that general proactive, we've got to get Bitcoin mining here. I think what's more real is that you've got this varying spectrum of acceptance of the benefits, acceptance of it. And you've got to remember, we're at a point in the cycle where a lot of people think Bitcoin's dead again and you know it, it's harder and it's probably not as interesting for them at a personal level, at least, as of what it was a couple of years ago. That'll change, as we know it always does. Um, so I think it's just general levels of maturity, openness, et cetera, within regulators, utilities, energy markets um, and regulatory bodies and a genuine willingness to actually try and solve the problems rather than being afraid to embrace a new industry. In Texas, we've seen that firsthand, you know, the ex um, temporary CEO of ERCOT coming out and proactively advocating the benefits of Bitcoin mining, the impact on the grid. We've had conversations in other markets. I think it's all about getting that quality conversation and education and taking them on the journey. No one wants to stick their neck out, right? It goes back to that old analogy. You're an institutional fund manager. You don't get fired for buying a blue chip stock. There's a little bit of that, I think. People are risk adverse. When you start looking at um, kind of the price of Bitcoin affecting the miners. There is this cyclicality to it, and we know that people are uh, getting smarter about it. They're getting better at predicting what those uh, price cyclicality will be, and then also how they will mitigate that on their business. High performance computing and other things could potentially provide some sort of uh, insulation from the Bitcoin price. How do you all think about Bitcoin price though? Is it something that like, hey, this is the single most important thing that we've got to understand, or is it not really that important to you, your business and the planning that you all do? Oh, it's absolutely important. If you don't have a long-term conviction in Bitcoin, then you're not mining it. Um, I think you accept the volatility along the way. I always chuckle when people complain about the volatility of Bitcoin. I don't know how else you grow an emerging monetary asset from a cent to half a trillion dollar market cap in 11 years, but maybe I'm missing something. The volatility is a feature, not a bug. You've just got to account that in your business model. So you've got to have a capital structure that can survive it. You've got to have an operating cost base that can survive it. And you've got to have operations that are flexible enough. So one of the key attributes in Texas and the benefit of building these proper data centers and integrating everything from a software, firmware, technology, infrastructure stack is we can basically pick our power price by flexing our uptime. So we can flex what price we mine Bitcoin at by just switching off during higher time price intervals in ERCOT, which de 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 delivers by definition a benefit to the participants in ERCOT because we're freeing up power when it's needed um, the most. So it, it is really important, but equally I think it's overstated in terms of the risk. If you're low enough in the cost curve, um, you get this downside protection because as the Bitcoin price goes down far enough, high cost miners switch off, global network shrinks, 
as a low cost miner ourselves, we get a greater share of those Bitcoin rewards every 10 minutes, which lowers our unit cost of production. So unlike traditional commodities, you get that double benefit being a low cost producer where you get a volume hedge and you mine more of the underlying commodity as the price of that commodity goes down. Makes complete sense. Daniel, my last question for you is around uh, creation of jobs. One of the things that you all have done a lot on is being that net positive inside of these communities, obviously building these kind of more traditional proper data centers means that you'll be there for a long time, as you mentioned. How do you all think about creating jobs in the communities? And then also, how do you think about the types of people that you're looking to hire, whether it's kind of at the corporate headquarters or at any of the facilities that you all have? Yeah, look, corporate headquarters, we're all traditional energy infrastructure finance people. We're not really crypto, um, to be honest. We, I think we've got a healthy skepticism for crypto broadly. And I think it's important Bitcoin versus crypto is a very different conversation. At a site level, um, look, it has been around moving into those regional communities where they've been decimated by the closure of pulp and paper mills in British Columbia, rehiring a lot of those local workers. And it's everything from electrical trades to uh, more computing technicians through to just general workers who we can retrain, educate on how to maintain our data centers and navigate through it. And I think that's been one of the biggest areas of positive feedback we've received at a community level, which is the ability to go in and re revitalize these communities. Daniel, I really enjoyed this conversation. You all are one of the top five, I think, publicly listed miners in the world, which is a pretty incredible feat. Um, where can people either find you on the internet or find out more about Iris Energy if they want to go and do more research? Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, irisenergy.co is our website. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. We try to be active. Um, welcome everyone's support. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we'll definitely do this again in the future. Look forward to it. Thanks, Bob. Man, that was a great conversation. I always enjoy talking to people who know what they're talking about. Okay, next up, we have CEO of HUD8, Jamie Leverton. I'm very excited to talk to her, so let's bring Jamie up on stage. Jamie, I thought a great place for us to start this conversation is in the differentiation you all have with many other miners. Most miners are Bitcoin and Bitcoin only, and they're just focused on go mine as much Bitcoin as you can and survive the bear markets. You all have this diversified approach where you are Bitcoin miners, but you also have a lot of high uh, computing power, computing performance that you're looked at as well. Can you help understand what is the difference between just being Bitcoin only versus some of the you know high computational power that you all have? And then what are the advantages to having more of a diversified strategy? Yeah, I'm happy to jump right in. So I'll, I'll take a step back a little bit. Um, HUD-8 was one of the first public, publicly traded Bitcoin miners. We went public in early 2018, originally on the Toronto Venture Exchange, and then over time moved up to the Toronto uh, Stock Exchange, and then dual we're the first Canadian public to dual list onto the NASDAQ in June of 21. I was brought in by the board in December of 2020, um, after HUD had gone through a particular, particularly difficult time during the bear market. I mean, all miners had a, had a rough go in, in that bear market, and those that survived um, were people like HUD who had Bitcoin on balance sheet, and we were able to use that Bitcoin to help kind of weather the dog days of that bear market. Uh, others survived because they were mining uh, other coins that had different economics, and, and that was able to carry them through. Um, and when the board looked to to bring on a new CEO, uh, one of the things that they were that they were focused on was somebody that had a background in tradition, more traditional compute or technology that had done transformation work in the past, uh, that loved Bitcoin, um, and and could start to think about how to diversify the company to kind of avoid that going through those that type of a bear market experience again. So I came in, uh, first thing we did was really focused on the balance sheet. We cleaned up the balance sheet. As I say, we do a listed onto the NASDAQ just to drive better capital markets access, more liquidity. And then we, we started growing the, the mining side of our business. But also, we're looking at ways to um, to bring in fiat-based revenue streams that were uncorrelated that could kind of help dampen some of the volatility of Bitcoin mining economics because there's so many, so much of Bitcoin mining economics are out of our control. We obviously don't 
don't control the price of Bitcoin. We don't con control the global network hash rate. Um, we also had the additional complexity of an, of an energy crisis and energy is our largest input cost. Um, so we, so we, looked, we looked at the industry and made the decision uh, to purchase our high performance computing business from another Canadian public company. So we, we bought it as an already established cash flowing business. We have two data centers in Toronto, two in Vancouver, one in uh, Northern BC, and they come with a diversified customer base, a variety of products, uh, cloud co-location managed services, which um, is obviously getting a lot of headlines today as we see an insatiable demand for, um, for GPU based compute driven by the explosion of AI and all of the excitement in, in that community, tons of new startups in that space um, and really for for GPU clustered compute unlike Bitcoin mining compute which is done by ASICs um, they really have to be in a traditional data center environment you need um, and of course we're interacting with customers on that side of the business so you need a billing team and a sales support team and a network operation center and all of all of those things that um, that go into giving a great customer experience which doesn't exist in a Bitcoin mining world where predominantly we actually don't have end customers. When we're prop mining, we are really just putting the compute power to, to the Bitcoin blockchain and receiving Bitcoin in return. So it's a very, very different kind of go to market motion. Um, but we my background is almost entirely from the traditional tech side. I spent 22 years in trad tech before coming over to HUT and a lot of it in data center and infrastructure. So I really see a world where over time, the type of computing that we do in a Bitcoin mine, which is really, really um, a lot of power, super, tons of density, but we don't worry about um, excessive security controls or uh, redundancy. It's all just single feed power and it's really built to be a flexible workload. So the a Bitcoin mine will power up and down on minutes notice based on power pricing or the peak demands of the local grid, depending on how, you, how we're working with local operators. Whereas a traditional data center workload, including GPU clusters, it's a net taker that base you need a stable base load you need to that data center needs to be up and running uh, 24 hours a day seven days a week and there's a ton of complexity that goes into how we ensure those data centers don't go down at uh, dual power feeds multiple generators ups um things that we don't need to have in a bitcoin mine where it's a flexible workload and ultimately it's not customer data that's being protect, protected at the end of the day it's just pure horsepower being applied to the to the algorithms. When you start looking at that high performance computing, it's obvious how the Bitcoin mining um, is very kind of straightforward. And as you described, a bunch of advantages to it. Are there things that you're actually able to in the future potentially put these together? Can Bitcoin mines perf uh, perform better or benefit from actually going into some of these, you know, kind of redundant type facilities? Or is there an advantage to keeping them separate facilities and actually using what is kind of unique to Bitcoin uh, and the mining process and, and not trying to commingle these? So ASIC compute does not play well with uh, other types of compute, just the, the, the pure, the heat, uh, the environmentals. You, you don't you don't mix. There were a lot of experiments to actually bring um, ASIC compute into tr traditional data center environments during the uh, 17, 18 bull run. And it was just proven out that they it creates all kinds of uh, environmental imbalances within a traditional data center environment. And frankly, the cost is too high, because if you think about um, to build the infrastructure to support a Bitcoin mine, you're looking at anywhere between kind of three hundred and eight hundred thousand dollars per megawatt depending how you build it out whereas in a traditional data center environment because of all the security and redundancy you need you're looking at you know it could be anywhere between eight and 13 million us dollars per megawatt so really really massive difference in approach um, that is is difficult to intermingle and again primary differentiator is a traditional data center is a is a net taker they're always taking the power whereas the the benefit and beauty of a bitcoin mine is that it is a flexible load and can work in conjunction with the grid in a way a traditional data center can't um i do think we're going to see parts of these worlds converge a little bit more over time um but it's still very much early days.
We just talked about the differences, but the similarities are pretty obvious in the sense of you're running servers or computers and it's hardware. You got to plug them in, you got to take power, and then you got to do different things with them. Uh, That's right. Talk a little bit as to uh, kind of the story right for public markets so much of public market investing is about the narrative is about the story of a company and being able to say look it is two different things and there are differences in those things but also there is this commonality that positions you all at kind of the forefront or the tip of the spear of computing for this next generation of all of these different applications how do you think about what that story really is and the power of being able to share that versus just being you know kind of a single focus bitcoin miner yeah, I think really the power comes in our ability to to flex as as market demand and um, and economics evolve. We also can drive synergies from things like uh, a network operations center that is monitoring is there to monitor our uh, data center sites twenty four seven. There are things that they can do to help on the on the Bitcoin mining side as well, which are also running twenty four seven, but with with a different type of manpower outlay. Um, of course, you always have synergies when you're when you're looking at the corporate structure. So, from um, all of the corporate functions that that support our Bitcoin mining side of the business can can equally support our uh, data center side of the business. Um, and again, I do think we're going to see an increased world of convergence. And there's all kinds of uh, innovation happening behind the scenes on, um, you know, can can potentially. GPUs go into a container type of environment and take advantage of some of the lower cost power available at Bitcoin mining sites. How does how do we how do we handle some of the network connectivity issues for those types of applications? But that's certainly work that's being done, and I think we're in the the infancy of it. But over the next you know two to four, three to five years, we'll continue to see uh, products and offerings and potentially um, even hardware that starts to bridge these worlds in a, in a more meaningful way than we've seen t- to date. When you start thinking about capital allocation decisions, obviously you have a dollar to spend. How do you think about the return or the risk that you take by diverting it to either side of the business? It, it's kind of this fascinating exercise where maybe there's not just one answer and there's some you know variables there, but how, how do you think about that capital allocation? Yeah, it's in in the Bitcoin mining side of the world, when we think about allocating capital, how we look at it, you have to you have to run massive sensitivity analysis where you're really guessing on where the price of Bitcoin and global hash rate are going to be at any given point in time in that re- in that return profile that you're building for the investment in in the mining hardware in particular. And that's why um so we're actually in the middle of a merger that's pending um, pending final approvals with a private Bitcoin mining company called USBTC. And one of the things that we love about the USBTC model, they're diversified uh, in a just like HUD is, but rather than being diversified into HPC, um, USBTC is diversified into, they do prop mining, but then they also do hosting for other miners and they have a managed infrastructure operations business, which is really just, uh, think about it almost as professional services. They bring their uh, their bodies and their purpose-built software in to manage mines for, for other people. And all three of those businesses have a much, much different capital profile. The most intensive uh, business across both HUD-8 and USBTC's operations is prop mining. Prop mining, uh, highly, highly, highly capital intensive, a ton of variables that you're really just um, kind of running sensitivity analysis and, and making your best guess on where, where the returns will go over a period of time. Um, whereas hosting much less capital requirement because um, the, the client brings the mining equipment uh, and in the case of MIO, really no no capital investment at all. And then, as I said, on the HUD side, prop mining, uh, we also have a repair center and then the HPC side. So it gives us a lot of flexibility based on what we're seeing in the macro environment, either on traditional HPC or on the Bitcoin mining side. And we can kind of flex between the different the different lines when we think about what's the best allocation of capital, obviously in a go forward state, assuming we're successful in our merger. 
So obviously you've got this uh, kind of capital allocation decision, but there's also M&A, which is another form of kind of capital allocation. Uh, you all seem to be one of the more aggressive uh, companies in the public markets that have Bitcoin mining, but also are pursuing M&A strategy, whether it's with other public companies or private companies. Talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the advantages you see there, maybe the opportunity set in terms of uh, choosing not to do this once, but it seems like now this is becoming somewhat of a strategy. So what are you seeing there? Yeah, I think, I mean, I come from a bit of a unique background where I've got a lot of experience in transformation and uh, with distressed. Um, the, the the strategy we took in the bull market was to really um, focus on shoring up the balance sheet. We have a large stack of Bitcoins. We've got over 9,000 Bitcoin on our balance sheet that's unencumbered. Very, very, very little leverage uh, in the business. And um, my thesis was the Bitcoin um, cycle has always repeated in a very similar fashion. Uh, and so my I, I was taking the view that the last bull market would eventually end and, and we would roll into a bear market, which is obviously uh, what we saw. In this case, the bear market for miners in particular, um, especially challenging on the back of the energy crisis, as well as um, lower Bitcoin prices and a global hash rate that just continues to grow. So kind of the perfect storm uh, for miners and uh, in our case, because we had shored up the balance sheet, we had already successfully um, done our first M&A transition transaction being the HPC business that was integrated. Um, and I really, when looking at kind of what was happening in the market and the opportunities available, um, it, it felt to me like your dollars were going to go further in um, through investing in inorganic growth and organic, particularly with the challenges we've seen in the supply chain. So just really, really high prices across the board, long lead times. Um, whereas in, in the inorganic space, opportunities to, to do pickups that give you kind of an immediate benefit without exposing you to, to the challenges on the inorganic side. And then when you start thinking about those M&A opportunities, obviously being a Canadian-based business, you've done some stuff in Canada, now you're doing some stuff in the United States. Are there other geographic regions that you're focused on or think could be strategic for you? Yeah, I've spent a lot of time looking at assets in, in various regions. I think um, it's really it's really important to look at um geopolitical risk not just not just short term but long term and that can be a challenge we also kind of markets that i that i really liked um ended up um uh, not faring well in the energy crisis and so, so that kind of changed the perspective there i think um some of the technology we're seeing uh, continue to advance in immersion. The economics are, are starting to get more attractive. That opens up hotter climate markets. Um, I think the UAE in particular has done an incredible job of really attracting some of the best and brightest in um, in digital assets from across the globe and, and certainly have a very um, open, easy to navigate regulatory environment. Uh, but it remains to be seen from a mining perspective what what um, might make the most sense, but certainly open to it. And I and I like the jurisdiction. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, when you think of regulation, you talk about the jurisdiction there. But what about in the United States or in Canada? How has that affected decision making for you? All? Yeah, I think we're we've got the fortunate position of really just being focused on Bitcoin. It's only Bitcoin we hold on our balance sheet. We really are just infrastructure as far as um, as far as the the markets are concerned. We don't interact uh, directly with with retail consumers or, or any any other kind of token. And I think really the focus in the U.S. Uh, right now from a uh, regulatory perspective is more is more focused on exchanges and other types of securities or seems to be broad consensus that Bitcoin uh, is a commodity. And uh, certainly um, that's that's what we feel as well. One of the challenges we're seeing on both sides of the border in, in Canada and certain jurisdictions in the U.S. is really um, some in some cases, a lack of understanding about how Bitcoin mining really works and how it can benefit local grids and local communities. And so in an absence of understanding, we've seen, uh, unfortunately, some mining moratoriums or mining bans. So it's really 
it's really a jurisdiction by jurisdiction in Canada, province by province, the U.S. state by state, um, as to as to how how mining is being perceived, and and that I think as an industry, one of the areas that that we really need to be focused on is education, and really kind of breaking down a lot of the misunderstanding that that surrounds Bitcoin mining, and and drive more conversations that lead to kind of thoughtful regulation and and us being able to really partner with grids and communities in a way that benefits all parties, which I think is the unique beauty of this type of load. Um, there is no other industrial scale um, power consumer like Bitcoin mining that can that can work seamlessly with and to, to help support the grid, uh, but also to stabilize and, and help monetize without the need for government subsidies or intervention. My last question is that you are not a Bitcoin luddite. You didn't necessarily, you know, uh, kind of come to Bitcoin and be like, "Oh my God, the government's going to fail, and I'm going to get rich because of this." Uh, you've had a, a very impressive career. Uh, maybe what are some of the surprises as you've gotten deeper and deeper into the Bitcoin market, into kind of the culture of Bitcoin, into the mining process? Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you that was either uh, kind of an assumption that ended up not being true, or maybe something that was a surprise uh, as you kind of built all this out? Certainly the biggest surprise was how supportive and collaborative the entire community is. I mean, coming from traditional technology, all, mostly all of my career was in large in large public companies. Um, I did a stint in, in at one of the banks and capital markets. Um, and there's certainly, there isn't the level of collaboration, kind of this spirit of community that permeates the, our space. Um, that that was the biggest surprise, and it and it continues to be. We um, all of the all of the companies really in our space know each other. We're broadly trying to do what's in the best interest of the industry. When when we think about, um, you know, we we created the Bitcoin Mining Council a couple of years ago, really to help bring um, a unified opportunity for us to speak and and speak out in defense of some of the 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 misunderstanding and the FUD that was permeating the headlines often about the energy use. Um, and so I think really just doing as much work as we can as an industry to educate, again, critically important. But biggest surprise for me is just the, the amount of positivity. And really, at the end of the day, everybody wants the industry to be successful and, and is are supporting the participants in order to ultimately get us to the place that we think this industry uh, deserves to go. Jamie, where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about HUD-8? Uh, I have the great benefit of a name that doesn't exist on anyone else on the planet. So at Jamie Leverton, the way I spell it, if you Google it, assuming you don't find one of my imposters, uh, it's literally at Jamie Leverton on Twitter, on LinkedIn. I'm super, super easy to find as is HUD8. Our website's HUD8.io um, and really just super thrilled to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. We'll definitely do it again in the future. That would be great. Thanks, Bob. Wow, that was another great conversation. Our next guest today is Harry Suttup. He's the CSO at GRIT. Very excited to talk to Harry. So let's bring him up here on stage. So Harry, a great place for us to start this conversation is above the fold, which is the most important real estate on a company's website. You all have American Industrial Company. You don't talk about Bitcoin. There's no mention of Bitcoin above that fold. And now I don't want to specifically just talk about grid. I want to talk about the broader industry, this idea that Bitcoin mining is an American industrial uh, kind of business now. Now it is important for America and it does fall into this kind of industrial component. Talk a little bit of how you all think about that and why it's not necessarily just Bitcoin, but this is a much bigger effort. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. Um, and it, it is baked into our DNA. We, we didn't name the company Grid Bitcoin Mining. We named, we named the company Grid Infrastructure um, because we believe that money and energy are foundational infrastructure layers to a functioning society and a functioning economy. Um, you know, like with, with most things, we've got to look to the 1850s um, to think about sort of how how did the the capitalist front end of the locomotive pull all the cars behind it? Um, and and what we found is that when you introduce a private industrial use case to a public good, being the American you know the, the power infrastructure that's out there, the American grid, um, introducing a new capitalist private market 
participant to the to the existing status quo is what unlocks formative uh, innovation. So we've seen this in with you know the the advent of petrochemicals basically pulling railroad systems into the modern age. We've seen this with the introduction of internet companies pulling fiber and and you know sort of L1 internet technology into the modern age. And now we're seeing this from a financialization of energy perspective, electricity perspective, where what Bitcoin mining is doing is it's bringing a new revenue stream to the power companies and the and the power generation asset owners all over the country and all over the world. And it's creating a new incentive to bid on those megawatt hours and being able to monetize those megawatt hours in fundamentally sound hard cap supply money. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of the bidding? There's two components that I haven't really heard that many people talk about. The first is what I'll call persistent bidding. So when there's electrical companies or there's data center businesses, usually they have sales teams that go out and they try to sell things or they're constantly looking for who's going to be the buyer. In this case, there's 100%, 24-7, 365, a buyer who has that persistent bid. So that's first is persistent bidding. And then second of all is what I'll call transparent bidding where everyone knows what the bid is, and so therefore you can then make decisions. How does that differ? What are the advantages to those two things? Yeah, I, I think it, it's foundational in the way that um, in the way that Bitcoin mining intersects with the generation um, of electricity. The, and I'm so glad you, you mentioned the persistent bid or continuous bid. Bitcoin miners are always bidding at or below a break even price. So right now, you know, that that might be, you know, with a hash price of $65, $70 per hash day, um, that may, you know, that may translate into a 20, 30, $40 megawatt hour. That number is being pushed to the market 100% of the time. Um, the reason that the market is able to either meet or not meet that continuous bid is twofold. And this is why it's so interesting. You know, you get into like a, a bit of a three body problem where there's the actual uh, supply side availability. So that dramatically changes whether the wind is blowing, sun is shining, turbine spinning. Um, then there's the price, which is a mixture of that, of that availability and that demand. And then there's the, the third layer, which is sort of the implicit demand. So let's say you're running a natural gas peaker plant and you spin it up and spin it down based on these dynamics, you're incurring a maintenance cost and a, and a system useful life cost that's, that's happening quietly in the background. So there's this third component and that, you know, nuclear is the sort of the obvious one. You've had some incredible nuclear guests on um, in the past, but, but this idea that if I were to toggle down the infrastructure, I'm actually eating an enormous cost relative to the useful life and terminal value of the plant. And so what Bitcoin miners are, are slotting in to do is number one, making a market between the, the, the real time supply and demand in, in the power availability. But the third is that they're, they're taking this long view and supporting the quality of this infrastructure over a multi-decade um, kind of time horizon where millions and millions of dollars are being saved on maintenance from not having to run the plant suboptimally. And the additional useful life represents a whole universe of additional cash flows. And so the value of that asset gets to be maintained for a much longer period of time. And therefore, they're able to deliver that lower cost power because they're able to, to generate so many more years um, of cash flows out of the asset. When you start thinking about these electrical businesses or, or kind of these various uh, providers of power, most of them were built to just provide power regardless of who the bidder was. Uh, are we going to start to see large scale infrastructure built specifically for the Bitcoin use case? And what I mean by that is not, oh, I want to have a vertically integrated, you know, off grid type thing. We've seen that. Uh, I was involved in something called PRTI with my friend Jason, who, you know, mm -hmm. went and was trying to convert tires into energy. And, and it was a very easy consumption off grid. But I'm talking about a city, a state, maybe even a country that says, hey, we're going to go build a, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollar power plant or power generation facility specifically for only this use case. Or are we a little ways away from that? Um, I think that we're still we're still somewhat a little bit away ways away from it. 
I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we we stumble on as a Bitcoin community from time to time is that, you know, we we're not that big yet. You know, we're still we're still kind of emerging from first, second, third inning kind of playbooks. Uh, and so I think that, you know, while a Bitcoin miner is sort of the critical component for, let's just say, a, a generation asset somewhere between. 25 megawatts and 500 megawatts, you know, the, the large scale providers of electricity in the U S are generating, you know, 30,000, 50,000 types uh, of order of, of megawatt at a time. And so Bitcoin mining, even at the largest scale is not that big, um, even, you know, within the context of our power system. So I think that, you know, individual project by project getting greenlit, I think Bitcoin mining can be sort of the 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 linchpin, you know, revenue stream that that gets a no into a yes. It can also be a time game where, you know, I'm deciding if I want to build something this year or in five years because maybe I can't get it interconnected to the existing system and sell to the open market. A Bitcoin miner can green light a project sooner. But I think, you know, are we re-architecting? large components of the the american grid or the international grids that are out there you know i think that's less um compelling at this stage now flexible data center usage might be an easier kind of tam to try to tackle with that where you know we're already seeing all these gpus are getting you know ai training <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> hours allocated to them some of these clusters are running a, a sort of more power dynamic, flexible structure, you know, but, but again, it's still kind of early days, still kind of immature. We're still trying to shoehorn, you know, we're still trying to shoehorn these business models into a, a, a somewhat awkward shape, which is the current system. You know, the, the, the talk about a continuous bid um, made me think of this, which is just that, you know, most utilities would love to sell that extra power and they just might not have a contract structure that can do it right so there's a there's a, a financial market infrastructure problem more than there is a physical power market infrastructure problem so you know you go to some of these large-scale hydro operators um, in canada and the northern us they're just spilling water over the top of the dam and you know why why isn't that getting soaked up by a high density you know compute environment whether that's bitcoin mining um, or something else why? Because it's too hard to figure out how to write a contract to sell it effectively. And so there's, you know, there's a physical infrastructure upgrading that's happening, you know, quietly across the country. There's also a contractual and, and legal framework that's going through a similar upgrade. Um, and it's going to take some more time to get these kind of flexible rate classes out there. You know, you look at the demand response dollars available for curtailment to Bitcoin miners. It varies widely based on market, not because the, the curtailment is any more or less valuable in jurisdiction A or jurisdiction B, although it is, um, but just that some of them have a more flexible shape to those programs and others don't yet. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's got to happen um, to, to modernize kind of the rate class regimes across a lot of these utilities to be able to get the benefit of a better customer, which you know, we believe the mining community represents. Another idea that you have and, and have talked about that I think is fascinating is this idea that Bitcoin revenue today for miners is actually very small compared to what you think it'll become in the future. Now, obviously, people know that there's the block reward and then also there is a kind of transaction um, revenue. But describe a little bit why you have such deep conviction that actually the amount of revenue or the, the dollar amount of revenue is going to grow significantly for miners moving forward. Yeah. So I think, you know, what what people don't have a, a clear appreciation for yet is just how valuable and and um, how quick the compounding clock starts on these high value, low cost electricity contracts, these you know high flexibility data center setups, you know, the role that these types of business models can slot in and play uh, within, you know, within these larger systems. It, it really is transformative. I mentioned it, you know, with regard to kind of the plant useful life. But, you know, if you think of the, the you know, mining community out there, those are the best generation asset owners 
that there could be. They've got a baked in business model that doesn't require a sales and marketing team to basically take an existing plant that's trying to squeeze, you know, <laughs> I guess, you know, wine out of the rocks and you're able to bring an environment of abundance to that, to that asset immediately. And you're able to do so across three vectors. The first is utilization is going to go way up, right? The monetized hours is going to go to something above 97%. Then the second component is that the cost to operate is going to go significantly down. So the unit economics of each of those megawatt hours should improve drastically because you're going to be able to run the asset much cleaner. Right. There's not going to be all of this sort of maintenance and, and, and crazy spinning up and spinning down. And then the third is that the, the terminal value, we talked about this, the terminal value of the generation asset, which we which we view as as generation plus mine. The terminal value of that asset is so much greater because every additional useful uh, life year that you tack onto the back end has a free cash flow associated with it and has a multiple that then gets applied to it. So from an asset allocator's perspective, the opportunity to own equity in a power plant plus Bitcoin mine should be, you know, potentially an order of magnitude more valuable and interesting than just one or the other. When you start looking at uh, vertical integration, which is you're starting to get into here. I know that that's one of the things you all think a lot about. Where are the opportunities for vertical integration? Is it simple as power generation, get the mine, put them together? Or are there other maybe more nuanced or intricate ways that you guys think of vertical integration? Yeah, it, I think it's it's a really, really broad and interesting space. And like with most things, my my first principle belief is always that the best ideas haven't been had yet. So we think we've got some good ideas. We think other folks are doing some interesting things. But, you know, if I just imagine that the absolute best idea is still three years out, we're still seven years out. And I don't know um, that taking that perspective um, of open mindedness around the business models evolution, um, that's where we we get to sort of see these unusual things um, emerge that are highly accretive over time. You know, I think from a vertical integration perspective, you know, there's a ton of opportunity in the supply chain. We've, you know, we've seen Riot um, bought a transformer manufacturer and an engineering firm. We've seen, you know, uh, you know, this, what the Stronghold guys are doing with those two, um, those two power plants that they have. So we we've seen some of these behaviors emerge. This is, you know, this is not this is not totally, you know, a novel concept here. But I think when you think about the capex budget, you know, seventy to eighty percent of that sits at the ASIC, 20 to 25% of that sits at the electrical infrastructure and physical deployment. And, you know, whatever, 5% sits on the land, you know, we're, we're looking for, for fields where nobody else wants one. Um, so I think, you know, as you kind of look at that, that budget, the innovation opportunity absolutely sits on top of the ASICs. If you're able to get a you know a one percent difference in the ASICs, it's as good as a four percent difference in your in your build out budget. So you know the power law is kind of there to take advantage of, but we still are living under you know an environment where there's really a duopoly around the, the manufacturing. There, we've seen Canaan kind of get a little more involved in the market. Obviously, Intel has been a roller coaster ride in the market. So we've seen some of these you know number three, number four, number five type players starting to bring technology to the table. You know, we're watching closely what the folks at Block are doing, you know, around around their ASIC as well. So I think seeing some higher competition in that largest category and seeing some disruption there um, is what is what's going to be able to to drive sort of the nearest term piece of the value. But again, once you have Bitcoin on balance sheet, we don't know what you can do with it. We don't know if there's an opportunity to, you know, to take a role in a lightning routing business, to take a role in payment processing or, or, you know, or something else. But, you know, we take, we take sort of the full life cycle of view, which is electron, computer server, data center, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, the financial asset. And so across that arc, we think that there's significant opportunity to generate exciting business um, at each of those layers. Whether that should all happen under the same roof or not, those you know, thus far, buy versus build has been a no-brainer on the ASIC piece. 
and build versus buy has been a no brainer on the development of the of the mining environment. So those two seem pretty reasonably solved. It's about where do those other pieces start to slot in and what kind of maturing across these these other types of of uh, segments we're going to see over a little bit of time. My last question for you is around capital markets. Obviously, as a private company, uh, these Bitcoin miners have certain capital available to them. They're able to do certain things. In the public markets, that changes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worst. How have you all thought about the public-private dynamics, and why are you all so interested uh, in that public market? Yeah, I think you know the, there, there's, two, there's two components to it. The, the first is just from a pure capital formation perspective, the public markets have been the right place to build industrial scale Bitcoin mining companies. We've seen it across the sector, you know, for for a, a number of years at this point, whether it's, you know, the marathons, riots, fight for clean spark of the world. You know, all of those folks are growing and scaling uh, on the back of, of public market capital formation. And, and we totally get why we think it's attractive. The second piece is a function of governance, which is that, you know, there's a serious responsibility around producing hash rate and and be, being this security layer um, for the network that we that we work for right we're you know we don't have any traditional customers our, our customer is bitcoin is the bitcoin network um and so we think that being number one available for public purchase is a valuable decentralizing force across the industry um and the type of of scrutiny that the American regulators bring to the table is a huge asset for the Bitcoin network over time. You know, we've, we've seen, you know, total black boxes in the production of hash rate over the last 10 years, whether that's China and the Chinese ban, whether that's, you know, some of the stuff that's happened across Eastern Europe, you know, th that's all well and good. And everybody has a, a opt-in ability to enter this market and, and compete um, with their hash rate. Uh, but we think that, you know, the, the scrutiny and the level of attention to best practices that can come from a U.S. regulated public company uh, is a great asset for the network that we all work for. If somebody wants to find you on the internet, ask questions or follow up with you or find out more about Grid, where can we send them? Uh, Twitter, at Harry underscore Sudok and Grid at G-R-I-I-D. As Dion Sanders says, I ain't hard to find. Harry is the same way. So I appreciate your time today. Uh, I always learn something when I hear you speak. So thank you so much. And we'll definitely have you on again. Cheers, brother. Appreciate it. Man, we are on an absolute roll today with another great conversation. Next up, we have Jason Less. He's the CEO of Riot, one of the largest mining companies in the world. Let's bring Jason up here on stage. All right, Jason, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us today. I thought a great place for us to start would just maybe be hash rate. We've seen it explode and continue to grow and grow and grow, regardless of price up, down, uh, any kind of geopolitical risk in terms of China banning miners. Like hash rate just seems to be this thing that no one can stop. Is that how you look at it? And what do you think is driving so much of that growth over the last couple of years? Yeah, that is how I look at it. And I think there's a bunch of things that go into it. And I'll go back to... What, what's really kind of in the beginning of this growth over the period that I think about it, which you touch on, is the ban of mining from China. So when China banned mining in or around June 2021, the, the global network hash rate for Bitcoin mining just plummeted. It, it went from, I think it touched off 180 exahash and got down to as low as 60 exahash by some estimates, which wasn't surprising because that's where so much of the global hash rate was known to be located. That was a massive drop. So since then, the price, Bitcoin price has done some good things, done some bad things, and which is usually a driver of hash rate getting deployed. But that trend has continued on an upward trajectory. So there's, I think there's a number of things. One, there's hash rate that was in China that either came back online or has been relocated. That's a driving factor. I, I think it's naive to think that mining just left China entirely. When there's an economic incentive out there, hey, entrepreneurial people are, are going to figure out a way to, to, to capture that. So I think there's some of that going on. I think the other really big factor, which is a new phenomenon for this recent Bitcoin cycle, is all of the capital flowing into publicly traded miners. Five years ago, six years ago, there was just three, four publicly traded miners, and they didn't even have a ton of liquidity to most of those stocks. But 
since then, we're now up to numbers 15, 20. I'm not sure what the latest count is, but there are now so many publicly traded miners that are able to tap into additional capital markets to help fund expansion. And since these miners are in effect competing with each other for capital for the best story, they've been raising money and deploying that in a growing hash rate. So even though the price of Bitcoin has not been great over the past year, that capital that was raised in 2021 or 2022, beginning of 2022, is still getting deployed here. I think that's driving a lot, uh, at least from the U.S. perspective, of the growth, the growth of hash rate. And then beyond that, I think it's just the general growth of Bitcoin is capturing more attention and driving foreign investors as well, foreign operators to see the opportunity in Bitcoin mining, see the advantages it has to energy grids, and looking to capture surplus wasted low price energy and deploy that to Bitcoin mining. So there's a lot of positive factors and um, we see no slowdown in sight. Got to think the halving could slow down in some way, but we will see. So you mentioned that there was people who relocated those machines out of China, and we saw that the United States appears to be the big winner. About a third of all global hash rate now is within the United States. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are celebrating that. And they're saying, hey, it was you know, 55 60% in China, and now we got 33% here in America. Is there the reverse problem that could occur where could we get too much hash rate here within the US if we got up over 50% within our borders as well? I think it very well could happen, but I'm not concerned about it because I think what history has showed us is um, hash rate is is ultimately mobile. Just as quickly as we saw it leave China and come to the United States, it, if it left the United States, it could go somewhere else. And that would happen if there was adverse policy to the United States. If, if the United States government in some way was trying to control hash rate, was trying to influence miners in, in some adversarial way, well, that would take away the economic incentive to operate mining, and that would just push that hash rate elsewhere. So it, all things remaining equal, I think having a lot of hash rate in the United States is good. So much Bitcoin adoption is in the United States. So much economic activity is in the United States. It makes sense that the con consensus mechanism and security for Bitcoin is located here. It should be distributed globally, but it makes sense that there's a large footprint in the United States. And I think it's important that the United States supports that in order to advance uh, and continue its leading position in Bitcoin as this thing continues to snowball and take off over time. You mentioned the capital markets being a key component to that. Obviously, America, I think most people would agree, has kind of the most robust capital markets. We've seen uh, a d mon we've seen many different companies, including Riot, go and tap those capital markets. What do you think is really the advantage there? Is it just the sheer amount of capital? Is it the type between equity or debt? Or is there some other advantage that you all see being a publicly traded company versus being in the private markets that's an advantage? Yeah, so being as a publicly traded miner, you have access to these public mine, uh, capital markets for, for raising equity. So when you have a stock that, that is liquid, investors can, can buy the equity in your company, they aren't taking on as much risk as realizing that equity as they would be with a private company. So there are investment banks that are cater to Bitcoin miners, no, cater to all companies, but specifically to Bitcoin miners in this space where you have a public listing, they will either bring investors to you in the form of a private placement or run what's known as at the market offering for you, where you're essentially selling stock into the public market from time to time uh, to, br to bring cash in. So if you have a stock with a lot of liquidity, with a lot of trading volume, that is a very easy way to tap in and raise equity. It is you know, it is dilutive, but it is a low risk way that you are able to bring more cash into your business to help grow your business, especially when you think the time is opportune, uh, as opposed to debt where uh, the, the cost of capital might be less, but you're taking on more onerous terms that put your business at risk. And that's something that we saw materialize in 2022. So for the publicly traded companies that have a lot of volume and interest in their stock, Riot is one of them. Uh, it, it can become very easy to raise capital. I'll say there were a lot of companies that saw that opportunity and chased it and maybe didn't necessarily find it. If you're not bringing a lot of liquidity in your stock, you're not going to have that same ease of raising capital uh, in, in the public markets. But the fact is the U.S. has an incredibly robust stock market. There's so much trading activity and all of that volume, uh, at least for the segment that uh, is dedicated to Bitcoin mining stocks, Bitcoin stocks, is a, a, a valuable source of, of financing if you want to grow your business. 
Talk to me about Riot specifically. You guys are a $1.8 billion company today. The stock has traded all over the place in terms of it went down a lot. It's come back pretty strong. Um, how do you look at the business, uh, both from you know kind of your ability to tap the capital markets, but also what are you guys doing with that capital? Are you deploying more sh machines? Are you building out more uh, locations? Just kind of what's the plan starting here in the middle of 2023 looking forward? Yeah, so Riot's core focus is Bitcoin mining. We are a Bitcoin company. The main thing what we do is focus on trying to mine as much Bitcoin as possible for the lowest cost possible. We accomplish that through a number of ways. First, we've embraced a vertically integrated strategy where we aim to own and operate our own infrastructure. Riot owns um, a facility out in Rockdale, Texas. We've built 700 megawatts of capacity. That is now, especially with the exodus of mining from China, as far as we're aware, is the largest Bitcoin mining facility in the world. Uh, we are also building a second facility that when completed will be even bigger that has one gigawatt capacity a couple hours away near Dallas, Texas. So we are major builders, owners and operators of Bitcoin mining infrastructure. We fill that infrastructure with both our own hash rate and historically uh, hosted clients as well. We have invested heavily in buying Bitcoin mining equipment to grow our overall, overall hash rate to increase our piece of the pie of the fixed Bitcoin uh, rewards. We currently have a hash rate capacity when all of our machines are, are, will be online this year of about 12 and a half exahash, which is one of the leading hash rates in um, in the industry. That's you know about three, depending on the day, three, four percent of the global network hash rate. Um, I talked about a vertically integrated strategy. We invest in trying to control as much of our supply chain as possible. So we own our own electrical engineering and manufacturing company. That helps de-risk and uh, reduce the cost of building all the electrical infrastructure that goes into operating a Bitcoin mining facility. So going to the second part of your question, we have been lucky to have a very liquid stock and historically have used equity financing to help grow our business. We've put that really directly to work to growing our Bitcoin mining footprint. We raise capital, we build buildings, we build miners, we grow our hash rate. And uh, now with our new Corsicana facility that, that's under construction uh, that we expect to start coming online at the end of this year, uh, start of next year, we will have even significantly more capacity. Now, is equity financing the way to go forever? Uh, I, I don't think so, but I, I think it's been a very useful tool to date that has allowed us to grow our business at opportune times. Talk to me about the hardware that you all are using, right? Obviously, there's technology breakthroughs that occur. There's new iterations of uh, ASICs that come out. Uh, there's people who have tried all kinds of different things. How are you all looking at the current iterations and where you think that technology is going? We, we've always really focused on trying to have the most efficient cutting edge fleet possible. Um, by having the most efficient hardware, you're able to remain profitable through the different swings in Bitcoin mining economics, whether that's driven by the Bitcoin price or the network difficulty or both. So we, we really find it important to focus on having the most efficient fleet. So I think one of the moves that Riot made that really helped kick us up to the net last uh, bull market in 2021 was we invested heavily in upgrading our fleet in 2020. The halving had just occurred. Bitcoin mining economics were not fantastic. Uh, the price was still relatively low. It wasn't a popular time to be growing a Bitcoin mining business, but we uh, raised financing at the right time. We put that to work buying at then, at, the, at that time, the next generation hardware was the S19, uh, 30 joules per terahash machine by Bitmain. We invested a ton in that in 2020 and then through, the tw uh, through 2021 as well. So that exploded the size of our fleet. Now, you know, there, there's been advancements of hardware since then. Uh, we have a lot of that uh, 22 uh, joule per terahash machines in the form of the S19 XP. But it, it, it's really important because, um, you know, our, our goal is to maximize our margin and our goal is to survive. We have this, we have the vision, the belief in a Bitcoin future and making it there is really important. So if you have less efficient mining hardware, if you do not have the latest fleet, then you are a lot more sensitive to market events. So we we help um, improve, make our business sustainable and able to survive these swings in the market by both having uh, the most efficient hardware that we can get, and then also by having a, um, 
a very strong power strategy to ensure that we have very low power costs. Those are the two things that go together, the efficiency of your machine and the cost of your power. So we're able to report you know, one of the lowest costs of production uh, per Bitcoin in the industry as well. Well, it definitely seems to be working uh, out quite well for you guys. Uh, there's two things that are external to your business that I think most miners are thinking a lot about. The first is uh, many critics are pointing to the environmental impact of Bitcoin mining. Talk a little bit as to how you all think about those critiques. Is there some truth to it? Is there you know, not so much footing for them to stand on? And then are you doing anything different inside of the business given this kind of concern or at least attention being given to the environmental uh, components? So because of its transparency, people can get a good estimate of how much energy Bitcoin mining uses. Um, it's, a, it's a public system. That's that's one of the value properties. Uh, there's transparency in how it operates. You can look at how blocks are coming and uh, the difficulty and get an estimate of the hash rate and get a good estimate of how much power drives that hash rate. So that's been a source of criticism and attack for Bitcoin because critics just look, OK, this uses a lot of power. Okay, that's bad. Well, first, I just reject the entire premise that using power is a bad thing. Humans have flourished over time because they've used more and more power. We should aim to have more and more power uh, of, of different uh, sources of generation, absolutely, but have more and more power to help us flourish as uh, as humans globally. I think Bitcoin is an example of using energy to improve human flourishing. So I, I reject the criticism right off the bat that using a lot of energy is bad. Uh, we're using energy for a very good purpose. Second, with Bitcoin mining, th there's a very interesting relationship with energy grids. A lot of people might not realize that a good chunk of ge energy that's generated globally is entirely wasted. In fact, estimates are about one third of all energy that's generated globally is entirely wasted. That's because... There's no one to buy that energy. Uh, it gets lost in transmission, et cetera. There, there are a number of factors. That is a huge inefficiency that we have as a society, and we should aim to fix that inefficiency. Bitcoin mining is the answer to that because it is the one industrial scale load that has the ability to go on and off in very short periods of time. That helps stabilize grids. That helps improve the financial profiles of intermittent generation sources. So what we do in Texas, we operate in Texas with the ERCOT grid, which is a deregulated energy market, which is a more free energy market. We help stabilize that grid by buying power around the clock, including the low demand times when there's an abundance of, for example, wind generation, but there's not a lot of demand for power. We are that buyer of last resort all the time, but we have the flexibility to shut off when demand is really high. So you can think of Bitcoin mining almost like, and I know there's some criticism of this analogy, but a virtual battery and that we are taking in energy when it is in low demand and we are providing that energy back to the grid when it is in high demand. We are doing this not because a regulator policymaker told us to, but we're responding to market incentives. Price signals are always the most efficient communicator and Bitcoin mining has the ability to respond and answer those signals. So, what we're doing is cooperating with an energy grid, using price signals, making decisions that are economic for Riot, that make financial sense for Riot, but also stabilize and improve the ERCOT grid. So um, the, the, the point I want to get to is we're making decisions in the best interest of our shareholders to drive a low cost of power, to drive the lowest cost per Bitcoin that we possibly can. But we're having a positive impact on the energy grid when we do that. And we're very encouraged to see the relationships that we've made in Texas and on the federal level um, with lawmakers, policymakers, regulators, grid operators who understand the value that that brings to energy grids and are thus supportive of Bitcoin mining. Do you think that there uh, will be examples where people will try to copy the relationship that you have with ERCOT? Obviously, I don't think you guys have any special deal or anything like that, but you've really shown that it works. We've seen people at ERCOT, whether it's the former president or current uh, kind of executives there, talk multiple times in public about Bitcoin miners are helping to stabilize the grid. Bitcoin miners are actually good for our system. Bitcoin miners are good for the state. Does that kind of narrative end up permeating into these other states, or do you think that's a Texas thing and, and it's going to take a while for it to get into these other areas? Well, first, I'm very proud to share that um, the former ERCOT uh, interim CEO that you're citing recently joined Riot as our advisory board. So truly a, a believer in what Bitcoin mining is doing and, and a supporter of it. So we're, we're, we're very proud to share that recent news. 
Um, but I, I do not think it's restricted to just ERCOT. There, there's not a, and first, there's not a moat. There, there's not, it, it's a free market. We don't have some special relationship. The reason that we're able to do what we do, though, is because we have a strong balance sheet. We've invested in, ha in taking on the financial risk of very long-term power hedges. And those power hedges, those blocks of power, allow us to do these different things in the ERCOD grid, allow us to be a part of ancillary services, demand response programs, allow us to sell power uh, when the price of power is greater than the price of our hedge. So there's a big financial commitment that you have to make to be able to do that, especially at scale. With, with with capital, you, you can do that. Um, but otherwise, there's not a, a a regulatory risk that you can't that that, that you have to overcome to do that. Um, Texas is not the only environment where this benefit is being seen. I think you look at other states like uh, Wyoming, Montana, uh, uh, North Dakota. Now, I I can't cite grid operators quotes particularly there as as I can in in Texas, but you are, we are seeing these environments emerge as friendly environments for Bitcoin mining that are trying to get more Bitcoin mining there. Um, I, I think it's it's a, it's a tough story to tell sometimes uh, to someone who doesn't have an open mind because a lot of people get stuck on that energy is bad narrative. They just can't get back to, they just can't get past the idea of something using a lot of energy as being good. And I guess it would be counterintuitive to that mindset that, wait, actually, this thing that's using a lot of energy is going to be a net positive for your grid. It's going to result in a more stable grid, more predictable demand and additional supply available. Um, so the story is is not always easy to tell, but it's one that we work very hard on telling. And we know there's a lot of other allies out in the industry helping uh, to tell that as well. My last question for you is we've seen a ton of regulatory scrutiny uh, on the broader crypto industry. It seems like Bitcoin has kind of slid uh, past a lot of that scrutiny. And most people, both CFTC, SEC and other regulatory organizations around the world agree that Bitcoin is not a security. Um, and so it is getting different treatment, right? Obviously being treated not as that security. Is any of the regulatory scrutiny uh, either positive or negative impact on the business? Or is anything changing uh, in terms of the way that you guys are operating or interfacing with those regulators? So the different regulatory events that have taken plus taken or regulatory scrutiny that we've seen over the past year, when we know what comes to mind is you know, three arrows, Luna, FTX, and now recently we have the SEC going after Coinbase and, and, and Binance, all for all for different reasons. Um, the that does not directly impact our business in that we are just mining Bitcoin. So the blocks keep coming. We're still mining blocks. We're still able to sell that Bitcoin. But it does impact our business in that it, 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 it indirectly it kind of puts this more negative cloud over our sector. That makes a number of things hard. I mean, one, it makes banking relationships more challenging because banks maybe aren't as discerning and they just simply think, OK, we are not getting involved with any cryptocurrency company no matter what. That, that was a problem for a lot of Bitcoin companies, even if they didn't touch this other stuff. That was a problem for a lot of Bitcoin companies at the start of this year. And I, could, I think it continues to be a challenge uh, for many. Um, I think when you think about it on the public policy uh, level as well, uh, you, if you're trying to make that energy argument that we were talking about with Bitcoin mining, but someone doesn't have enough depth to get beyond just um, using energy is bad and, hey, this Bitcoin is like this FTX thing. What about that? Then, then you have a lot of problems. So. These things indirectly, I believe, make Bitcoin's work, uh, advocates work a lot harder in the advocacy space uh, with, with, with lawmakers and policymakers, et cetera. That being said, there are a lot smarter lawmakers out there uh, than, than, than you would believe. And there's a lot of support for Bitcoin and there's a lot of support for Bitcoin mining. So it's important that we as an industry continue to invest in that, investing in education, reaching out to congressmen and senators, reaching out to whoever in government you're able to have a relationship with and you know, make sure that you express your views and your support of uh, uh, Bitcoin. That is important and that all helps. And as industry players, we have an even more important role to play in that. So it, it ca casts the cloud. It makes that initial conversation hump a little bit harder. Um, but I think we're making very good progress. 
Jason, I always enjoy talking to you. Not only are you enthusiastic about Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, but I think you're incredibly articulate in terms of what Bitcoin mining is able to do uh, for the Bitcoin industry and also what it can do for uh, electrical grids and kind of the, uh, the the more local communities that you all operate in. If somebody wants to find out more about Riot or they want to get in touch with you, where can we send them? Best place to go to would be uh, either our Twitter or our website. Our Twitter is at Riot Platforms. We post a lot of content and videos all the time. You can get a good glimpse of what uh, operating a Bitcoin mining operation at our scale looks like. Or additionally, you can go to our website at riotplatforms.com. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We'll definitely have you again back soon. Awesome. Thank you, Anthony. As some would say, bang, bang. What another great conversation. Next up, we have Matt Lestro. He's a co-founder of Giga Energy. They're doing some awesome work around gas flare mining. I'm very excited to talk to him. Let's bring Matt up here on stage. All right, Matt. So I thought a great place for us to start is you all are one of the businesses who have figured out how to capture all this flared gas and go ahead and turn it into uh, power that you then can generate Bitcoin with. And that sounds amazing. It sounds like this great thing for the environment. It sounds like you were on the cutting edge of innovation. How the hell does it work? Yeah, so uh, it's actually a very simplistic process uh, with a lot of engineering behind it, uh, but the four steps are pretty simple. Uh, there's flared natural gas happening uh, where this is the product of oil producers creating uh, natural gas as a byproduct. They can't get it to market, but they still want to produce their oil, so they burn off uh, this natural gas instead, which is, you know, wasted energy. Then we go in, we capture that natural gas, use it to power a natural gas generator, which creates electricity. And then in step three, we use that electricity to power Bitcoin miners modularly on site uh, at the oil well in the middle of nowhere, 50 feet from where this oil is being produced. Uh, and then in step four, you know, we send that Bitcoin uh, directly to uh, our wallets and we're able to monetize it from there. So you're building this off-grid mining capability. And off-grid, I think people have heard the term before, but they don't really understand the pros and cons of that. In one way, you're yeah. saying, hey, look, they can't actually move this. So being off-grid is really important. But what are the pros and cons in your mind of doing it off-grid versus being attached to one of these grids somewhere in the United States? Correct. Yeah. So being on-grid, you know, there's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, the biggest thing uh, is going to be size of your operation. You can go and you can have these mega farms where you just have rows and rows of ASICs. Uh, I, you know, 10, 20, 30 buildings uh, in one location, and you get that economies of scale. Uh, but part of the downside is being able to move slow. Uh, you are then regulated. Uh, you have platform risk in terms of utilities deciding, you know, a year later, we don't like Bitcoin miners. We're going to ban them. That happened in Washington State. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you need transformers. Uh, off grid, you don't need transformers. So if you're talking at that size um, between lead times, interconnect schedules, you could be 18, 24 months to achieve that magnitude. Uh, off grid, it's very different. Uh, it's smaller, it's more versatile, uh, but you're not necessarily always alone on spot. So you're, you're going to be in that 10 to 20 megawatt range um, and not be able to get up to that you know, 500 megawatt range. Uh, but you have the ability to forego capital expenditure for transformers. You have the ability to um, plug in in less than a week. Uh, and that stuff you know, is very powerful when you're trying to get up and, and mine that Bitcoin as quickly as possible before the happening. And so when you think of these uh, kind of flared gas facilities that you all have, um, talk about the environmental impact, right? This is one of the big things that everyone's talking about around Bitcoin mining, whether they should be or they shouldn't be. Uh, it's pretty hard to argue against capturing flared gas and being able to use it without hurting the environment. But how do you all look at it? Yeah. So methane as a greenhouse gas is 25 times worse for the environment in terms of its heating value. 25 times stronger. And so those flares that are being burnt up in the air are 91% efficient. You have this big old flame that's not combusting 100% like it would in an engine. And so when we do combust an engine, it has about a 9% uh, increase in overall combustion rate, which leads to about 60% in overall CO2 reduction on the emission side. So that's one part is we're, we are legitimately reducing CO2 emissions. The second part of that is the uh, volatile organic compounds. These are uh, cancerous molecules uh, being burnt in the air. And if you live next to them, I mean, it's not good. Uh, so, I mean, there's kind of two sides to, you know, some people uh, debate uh, the, the climate side, uh, but the part that, that it cannot be debated whatsoever, the scientific evidence surrounding uh, living next to uh, these flares, uh, which are often, you know, in developing countries um, where you don't have federal agencies like EPA to, to govern their safety. 
Talk about the United States versus other jurisdictions, specifically around environmental concerns, but also around uh, all of these regulatory things. We've talked with a number of people about how regulation is helping shape some of the decisions they're making about site selection or, or maybe even the assets that they're keeping on their balance sheet. Yeah, I, I, so domestic versus international, I also call synonymous with uh, private versus public entities. So uh, in the U.S., we're going to be talking a lot uh, with private companies that have different incentive structure. Uh, there's much more um, pipeline build out, which leads to kind of different economics surrounding how long will those wells be there? What are the size of the wells? Uh, and in the U.S., you know, quite frankly, the wells are going to be smaller because we have so much infrastructure in place. When you go international, you're going to be talking with more public entities. Most oil and gas is nationalized by the local countries. Uh, so you're going to be talking you now with the, a very different set of customers, ones that are not necessarily incentivized by dollars, but incentivized by um, public perception, uh, that are incentivized by uh, re-election uh, and things of that nature. And when we look around the world, are there certain places where you've seen those public type of entities become really open-minded about Bitcoin mining? Obviously, people have heard about like El Salvador trying to do a bunch of different stuff, but are there other places that you all are at least paying attention to or excited about? Yeah. So, I mean, the unfortunate part when talking with these, these entities is they don't necessarily care about the Bitcoin. They care about you solving their problem or their thorn in their side, which is, you know, the case with any customer. Uh, and we've, we've said to them, hey, this is what we're doing. They're like, okay, so you're going to take this. Whatever is happening in this box that you play here, we don't care as long as it solves our problem uh, is, is usually kind of the general theme that gets around now. You know, we're always trying to use this as an opportunity to orange pill uh, these guys, but that's usually the reception that we get. And really what they're trying to solve the problem for is the gas flaring itself. Exactly. The gas flaring itself, uh, which in you know, some places uh, in countries, I mean, presidents are getting starting to be impeached over uh, because you're flying, you know, maybe in the Amazon uh, and there's a ton of environmental activists. Talk to me about the unit economics of building these kind of on-site, off-grid type facilities. So uh, the largest component of capital expenditure, excuse me, is the natural gas generator itself. The wonderful part about that is though, uh, is that it's easily financeable. It's a hard oil and gas asset that, that doesn't care about the price of Bitcoin. Uh, the second part of that is gonna be your off-grid data center. So something that can withstand hot temperatures, uh, be in harsh environments and keep those computers cool uh, and waterproof at the same time. Uh, and then you're gonna be going in doing all the site installation overall um, is what it looks like uh, in terms of the business standpoint, what we're currently uh, doing in, in, uh, at scale is, is what's called hosting. So we don't actually own the ASICs inside of the data center. We bring in a third party's customer. So we sign a GPA, which is a gas purchasing agreement with the oil producer saying, hey, we will buy your gas at a flat amount. We sign a PPA, which is a power purchasing agreement with the customer saying, hey, we will sell you power at a flat amount. Uh, and then we take that spread in between. And when people are actually mining the Bitcoin, how many of them are holding onto the Bitcoin versus they're selling it? Is it case by case? What, what are you seeing? So the thing about payback period in Bitcoin mining is it's usually denominated by the price of which Bitcoin is when you buy into it. Um, generally, it's always going to be about 24 months payback. Uh, whether you're, if, if Bitcoin stays flat at 25K, you'll get 24 months payback. If you buy in at 60K and it stays flat, you're going to get about 24 months payback because, you know, the net present value of those computers fluctuates to always hit that. Um, so assuming price stays flat, you know, people are keeping as much Bitcoin as possible and, and only paying for operating expenditure. Uh, the point of what happens is when you start your project at 60K, hold as much Bitcoin as possible. People usually start selling their bags on the way down. That makes sense. You all have another side of the business, which is really around products and equipment, kind of sales, if you will, of, of yeah. this stuff. Uh, talk about the uh, kind of benefits of being both building out the ventures and, and kind of on-site, off-grid type uh, facilities with also this sales component of your business around the products and equipment. Yeah. And I think that's the, the one of the most important parts of our business, both from a lead time perspective, which is very underrated, and both from a cost perspective. Uh, most people, when buying and uh, building out a Bitcoin mine, uh, they get a line item that says, you know, fans are going to cost this much. And they go, okay, I guess we got to pay for fans. And it's like, well, should we question that assumption? You know, we're all experts about, you know, ASICs and this and that and whatnot. But I mean, I really think uh, people don't pay as much attention as they should to on the hardware side. I think you make money on the buy. Um, so we manufacture all of our own electrical equipment in-house, the bus bar, the uh, UL, you know, uh, 
rated uh, switchgear systems, the main disconnect, the boxes themselves, the air louvers, uh, the fans themselves um, are, are created exactly for what we need. Uh, and so not only does this allow us to be you know, about four times faster and four times cheaper uh, than the industry average when it comes to Bitcoin mining off grid, but as well as it allows us to achieve efficiencies that are not otherwise possible when you can customize your equipment. I think when you do a home renovation uh, or you do you paint something yourself, you know, you know where all the imperfections are uh, in the system. Uh, and so when you have someone, same person who's building something is maintaining it, your uptime is unbelievably more. And when you start looking at this equipment, uh, we've seen, and let's just say the ASICs themselves, there's been a number of different generations of the equipment. It, you know, kind of every couple of years, there's improvement, there's innovation. How much of the other equipment that you all work on and sell ends up having kind of those faster innovation cycles where it's every, you know, two or three years versus these are things that people are buying and then they're really going to hold them for 10, 15, 20 years as if you would see in other kind of heavy inqu equipment uh, style industries. Yeah, so I mean, we 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 try and future proof our uh, hardware as much as possible for those iterations, and the, and the boxes are really on the electrical side and the air movement side. That's what they do. They rack a computer, provide electricity to it, and keep it away from the harsh environment. Uh, so we overbuild systems. Uh, we make sure that receptacles, uh, different types of ports, um, is good for you know what we believe and where we think uh, future ASIC uh, are going. Uh, but you know we're always trying to innovate as well. So. Um, Traditionally, we've done uh, air-cooled containers for the past four years. We're now moving in uh, to hydro-cooled containers uh, and building out all of our own infrastructure on that end. Uh, so there's a lot of new fun things on front. And as you see this equipment, who's buying it, right? Is this very large-scale publicly traded miners? Is this uh, kind of uh, Joe Blow in his backyard? Is this somebody who doesn't want anyone to know that they're mining? Where are these buyers coming from and who are they? Yeah, so our minimums are... are Pretty large, but we still have, you know, one-off buyers um, that, you know, want to get exposure to Bitcoin mining uh, coming to us. Uh, we also deal with a lot of large corporate publicly traded entities as well as private entities where they may have a custom request uh, for a t particular type of uh, electrical equipment or where they may say, hey, you know, we need farm build out uh, at our on-grid facility. We need, uh, we, we build all our own shelving, right? We, we custom built shelving as opposed to, you know, just going online, buying Costco shelving and throwing it up. Uh, Wouldn't you like something that's a little bit cheaper, fits a little bit more snug and provide a little bit more heat uh, management? Uh, and those are the things that we provide. Uh, so it's a wide range of clients from all sizes. And when you start looking at the people that are actually doing this, wh who are the, the folks that you all have? Are they all like hardcore Bitcoiners? Do you have electrical engineers? Do you have mechanical engineers? Do you have people from the finance world? Like talk a little bit as to uh, when you say we, who is that? Yeah, so Gig Energy, we're about 20 strong. We have 14,000 square feet of manufacturing facilities. We're based in uh, Texas, uh, just outside of Houston. Uh, so we're very proud uh, to, to be in the great state of Texas. Um, our team, you know, is comprised mainly of uh, blue collar individuals. Uh, we have a number of contractors too on top of that 20. Um, but I mean, you're talking, you know, electricians, fabricators, engineers, um, hardware designers, everything from that sense where you're really focused on uh, how do you get the best possible outcome of your product. And the great thing is, you know, we initially started building our own data centers because I needed a data center really quickly and I needed a custom. Then we got into generators because I couldn't buy enough generators as quickly as we needed to because everyone's so freaking slow and old in the generator industry. Um, and that's really just naturally how it's come about. And then from in, customers say, hey, we want to use your products because you use your own product. And when you see so many people rushing into the Bitcoin market, uh, the cyclicality ends up causing a lot of excitement in good times, a lot of pain in the bad times. Obviously, you all have these two different businesses within a business, right? You've got uh, kind of running the facilities where you are just as uh, kind of susceptible to those market cyclicality as anybody else. Sales, same thing, or is there a different story there? Different story. Uh, our revenue uh, has been up and to the right, uh, probably 30, 40% growth over the past seven quarters. Um, and I attribute that to not only you know us as a company growing, but also the stickiness with capital deployment as it comes with these cycles. People go in, they raise capital during the bull market, you know, get commitments. Well, not always that capital comes in, then they got to purchase it, then there's lead times. And so, you know, over the next 12 to 18 months, you really see capital get deployed past that peak Bitcoin price. Uh, so now 
uh, I, would, I would say right about now is where you're seeing people trying to raise new capital and struggling with that. Um, but as a company, I mean, we've been very fortunate, a very strong customer base and, and continuing to grow uh, on the product side. Now, have we gone through a 70% you know, downturn on hash price uh, with our profitability? Absolutely. And when you see so many different um, kind of uh, variations. We see people doing high computing uh, uh, facilities. We see people doing just Bitcoin. We see people doing flared gas. We see people doing kind of traditional data centers. There's literally all kinds of different approaches to this. Is that where you think the market kind of ultimately ends up? Is that there's different, uh, you know, kind of approaches, different um, infrastructure for different types of strategies? Or do you ultimately see this all condensing into people saying, look, there's one best practice as how to go and mine Bitcoin at the most cost effective way to do it. And there will be that consolidation in terms of strategy when this is all said and done. I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation. I think Bitcoin miners inherently uh, are... Uh, are uh, power arbitrage. Uh, you know, HPC is just another function of power arbitrage, you know, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not as exciting uh, maybe as, you know, changing the world on that sense. So I think, you know, some people avoid uh, getting outside of Bitcoin just because, you know, they really want to um, help further that mission. And that's very admirable. And I totally understand that. Um, but from a, you know, kind of overall macro field, I think a lot of some Bitcoin mining companies, I know some right now uh, are realizing, you know, the margins of, uh, the world being transformed with needing more computing power. Uh, right now, uh, by I think 2030, over 9% of the world's energy uh, is going to be going towards uh, computing. I mean, so it's, I mean, it's massive need, and I think that's going to only continue to grow more. How are you all seeing the funding environment? So we've got a number of publicly traded companies that are talking today, and obviously they've got American capital markets at their disposal, both equity and debt, and, and there's certain advantages to that, certain downsides to that. You all are a privately traded company, and so how is the fundraising environment uh, and kind of the funding environment there? Yeah, um, capital is tight. Uh, people, well, you know, People in general want to feel safe with their investment, feel good about it. You know, so if everything blowing up around them, uh, it's, it's very hard to feel safe, even if you have a fundamentally sound business in front of you that has profitability. Um, that's been our experience. You know, um, luckily, you know, we're very, uh, we're good. Um, company's growing tremendously. But uh, from what I've seen, what I've heard, everything's tightened up. Uh, much more, of course, on the later growth side. But uh, I think, you know, if you're raising a seed round or pre-seed, you, you have a lot better chance of finding funding. But Series A and up, I know, is pretty tight. What are the areas that you all are looking forward to in the next 12 months where you believe that there could be inflection points or that there's milestones for the mining industry? Obviously, we've seen hash rate continue to grow to the sky. Like, what are some of the things you all are paying attention to and excited about? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Exahash, we're at 380. I think it's really, it's just kind of, with Bitcoin mining, it's fun to see the stakes get bigger and bigger. You know, it's the same story again, but it's like, oh shit, now I got 10 billion on the line. Let's see how it goes. Um, so I think that's the most fun part is, it's like, okay, how's this cycle going to play out with like people getting liquidated just with larger numbers? Uh, and, and I think to me, the single biggest indicator for Bitcoin mining is hash price. That is, you know, dollars per unit of computing power per day. Uh, I mean, that's that is Bitcoin profitability, uh, and that's inherently linked to the price of Bitcoin, but also the total overall hash rate. Uh, we went through it in, in 2020. Um, uh, we got down to you know about six cent hash price. We're back down to you know eight. We're bouncing around eight to five and a half. Uh, this is all time lows. 60k Bitcoin. We're at 40 cent hash price. Um, so I think that's going to be fun. It's like how low is hash price going to go? with this happening event, you know, is this price going to rip and then, you know, supply get cut in half, we're still going to be around the same amount. Um, I think that's, that's going to be the fun part to watch for uh, in the next six months. One last thing I want to end with is uh, many of the people who some would deem your competitors are actually your customers. And there's this like interesting dynamic of collaboration in Bitcoin, uh, but also competition. Obviously, there is only so many Bitcoin that are getting created every day that miners potentially could go and mine. And so talk a little bit about that dynamic of collaboration, but also competition. You know, um, uh, it helps in terms of uh, uh, information asymmetry. We, we know a lot about the projects going on out in the Bitcoin mining world just naturally because people are asking us to help build them. Um, so from like a kind of company business model perspective, that's pretty helpful. Um, 
And, you know, it's kind of one of those funny things, you know, everyone knows what, you, what, what you're doing. And I think the markets are so efficient um, to the point that it's polarizing where no one really thinks of you. It's like if everybody's a com- kind of competitor, is really anybody your competitor? Um, that's the way I look at it. You know, some people try and get a little bit niche and say, okay, natural gas, Bitcoin mining competitors or, or something like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's putting on hash rate. So whether it comes from solar, hydro, wind uh, type of power sources, you know, they are inherently diluting uh, your revenue. That makes sense. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about Giga? Yeah. So uh, last name at Lostro. Uh, I'm on Twitter. And then um, the company gigaenergy.com. I uh, have a lot of information. Um, the team's growing larger. So you know, please reach out to us. Do you have any interest, projects, anything like that? Love to, love to chat. Amazing, Matt. Thank you so much. We'll definitely do it again in the future. All right. Thanks, Paul. Man, I swear I learn something new every single day in this industry. I absolutely love it. Next up, we have Fred Thiel. He's the CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings, one of the largest miners in the world as well. Fred pulls no punches, and he is an expert when it comes to Bitcoin mining. Let's bring Fred up here on stage. All right, Fred, I thought a great place for us to start our conversation here would be around this idea of vertically integrated technology stack. That's something that you all hang your hat on and are very proud to kind of take this uh, very unique approach in the Bitcoin mining space. Explain what a vertically integrated technology stack is and then why you all feel so confident that this is the right strategy for you. So if you think about how Apple has developed their whole ecosystem around the iPhone, they own the cloud software, they own a lot of the core apps, they own the operating system in the phone, they own the silicon in the phone, and they own a lot of the distribution medium. If you take that analogy uh, to Bitcoin mining, we have our own pool that we operate. We don't participate in a third party pool. Why? Well, if we're operating in our own pool, our pool doesn't have to be designed to deal with a lot of third party miners and dealing with people logging in and security and how do you make sure that a miner connecting to your pool is actually supposed to be there. Plus, as third party pools, you have to be prepared to take S9s, S19s, hashes from all sorts of machines. We have two machines running in our pool in our fleet today. It's S19J Pros and it's XPs. That's all we have to worry about. So we can optimize the pool to be super efficient. And by efficiency, it's communication latency, things like that. So we can pull out a nanosecond here, a couple milliseconds here. It just makes it more efficient. Then we run our own uh, operating system, our own firmware in our miners more and more today. We're in the process of rolling it out across our whole fleet. But the site we build in UAE is built soup to nuts on our own stack. And so by using our own firmware, it means we can overclock, we can underclock, we can adjust the exact performance of the miner specific to the environmental conditions, the energy pricing, whatever's going on, wherever we happen to be. So we get more efficiency gains there. Plus, because we control the firmware, most miners have bloatware in them. So if you think about it, the average miner has to have all the software it needs in it so it can run standalone. Well, if you're running 200,000 miners, connecting to your own pool, you need very little firmware actually in the miner. And so we can strip out a bunch of stuff that again, takes up clock cycles, uses more electricity and allows us to operate that miner more efficiently. We have our own controller boards, which allow us to do a number of things on the miner. And in our immersion solution, we've co-developed the immersion technology so we can fine tune the miner and the immersion system together. So now you have this whole system from the operating system in the cloud to the pool all the way down to the miner, the firmware in it and the immersion. Plus, we also made an investment last year in a company called Oradyne, uh, which is really designing the next generation uh, Bitcoin miner. It's a US firm designed by engineers in Silicon Valley, an amazing product um, that'll be coming to the market this year. And so there, the reason for that was we needed a, a couple of things. One is Bitmain, uh, while they make a good product, they have 60, 70% market share. It's almost a monopoly. And that's a high risk issue. If the US and China get involved in a trade war, there could be supply issues. So we needed to make sure there was a US manufacturer. More importantly, we wanted to be able to adjust the performance of a miner all the way down to the individual ASIC level. Because in times of high energy costs or high temperature, we needed to be able to tweak the miner all the way down at the ASIC level. And we wanted the miner to be configured in a way so we could do industrial scale mining 
with blades as opposed to using the shoe boxes that everybody else uses. And so we needed to have access to custom designing the miner. So think of us more like Apple and how they address things than how traditional miners do. So that's the, the nature of the vertical technology stack. What's fascinating to me is you basically are trying to reduce diversification in this technology stack and that you want control, right? You want the centralization. In your geography approach, though, you are seeking diversification and kind of trying to go all around the world. Talk a little bit about that specific strategy. Sure. So um, most miners tend to locate, um, try and build a large site for economic, economies of scale, right, in one location. Well, that makes you subject to two things climatology and regulatory and grid pricing, right? So if you look at um, you know all the people that operate in Texas and we have considerable sites in Texas, now you're subject to ERCOT, you're subject to the climate in Texas. You know, we're going right now into summertime here and as we're recording this in June, uh, we're having some of the hottest days of the year. So that's impacting performance. So by having geographic diversity in the US, you separate yourself from uh, issues specific to one grid operator, you separate yourself from um, climate specifically. So we're in Texas and North Dakota, opposite ends of the country, right? Different types of climates. Let's us operate very differently. At the same time, by moving offshore, and our partnership in the UAE is the first example of this, we're also creating diversification away from the US, which you never know from a regulatory perspective may or may not be important at some point in the future. But most importantly for us, it was the ability to partner with a sovereign wealth fund who controls the energy generation, the energy distribution, and the land, and the government regulations in a way that allows us to have the ideal partner so that we're sure about our energy costs for the full term of this agreement. We are, you know, we've nailed the energy cost. Um, we have the benefit of it being um, uh, fully offset. With Rex, it's a combination of natural gas and nuclear energy uh, over the life of the agreement. Um, and they invested enough capital in this, so they have so much skin in the game. So it's really critical for them to make this successful. Now, the benefit of this kind of poster child installation in the UAE is that now we have other countries coming to us. Uh, people in Qatar coming to us saying, hey, Marathon, we'd love for you to mine here. Oman, hey, Marathon, we want you to come here. Bhutan, hey, we want you to come here. Countries in Latin America, countries in Africa, we're looking at geothermal opportunities. So now these opportunities are starting to come to us because we think of it as uh, you're a technology company, you just won the perfect reference customer <laughs> as your partner. And so people want to come to you because they say, well, if you can work with these guys and you can do this, then you obviously are serious, you're well capitalized. And so we believe we're very well positioned to continue to grow internationally to the point where we'll have about 50% of our mining capacity outside of the U.S., 50% in the U.S. So you mentioned nuclear power, and that's something that I think people have always dreamed about is like, why don't we hook this up to uh, those types of power generation uh, facilities? What are you seeing on that front? Is that something that you think will become the standard? Do you think that it's still kind of fringe idea? Where are we? So uh, it varies by region, um, you know, in the US, uh, and generally speaking, in the developed world, after Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, uh, and Fukushima, there's been this kind of fear about nuclear energy. Um, the Ukraine crisis and the energy crisis that came from that got people to kind of revisit that. And we now have things like SMRs, small modular nuclear reactors. The difference between SMRs and the traditional large scale nuclear reactors is for one thing, they're um, not one-offs. You're making the same nuclear reactor over and over and over again. They're of a scale that's similar to what the U.S. Navy operates in submarines or aircraft carriers. These things are super safe. Most importantly, they use the spent fuel from traditional nuclear reactors. So now you're actually using up that old fuel. So you don't have to go dig up more uranium to make them operate. And they're very safe because if something happens in one of these things, you're talking about an area of just about a couple of acres around it that are potentially going to be irradiated versus a whole city. And so granted, they also generate less electricity, 30 megawatts, 50 megawatts. But these are perfect for solving the biggest problem we have with the energy grid in the U.S. today, which is lack of transmission lines. You know, you can build solar farms in rural areas all day long. You can build wind farms all day long. What's the problem is you can't get that electricity to where people live. Right. 
bulk of the population of the U.S. lives east of the Mississippi. Most of the solar generation is west of the Mississippi. Transmission lines are missing. It's going to take hundreds of billions of dollars to build the transmission lines. So you're much better off putting energy generation next to where the consumers are. And California today, they're building lots of solar on houses. You have solar at the community level. You have batteries together with that. Now the grid operators in California can actually borrow electricity from consumers' battery walls when they need it to avoid brownouts. Do that at industrial scale across the country. And now all of a sudden, transmission becomes less of an issue. And it's just the way the internet works. You put all the intelligence at the edge of the network and you leave the network as being kind of just dumb. That's exactly what we need to do with power generation. So SMRs are a great solution there combined with solar and wind and other renewable energy means. So as you guys kind of go around the world, are you pushing into these other geographies? Are you going out and seeking power generation opportunities? Are you going and trying to figure out where you kind of fit in, in in these geographies? Or are you being pulled? Are you getting phone calls from whether it's governments or private companies and they're saying, hey, please, please come here. And there's almost like a competition to get where you're going to go open your next site, similar to how Amazon HQ kind of has a competition among cities. How How is that uh, from a push or a pull standpoint? It's definitely more of a pull situation today. Uh, you know, after our success with the UAE site, you know, uh, we've gotten calls from Qatar, Oman, uh, Bhutan, uh, Kenya and Africa, um, Latin America countries there. So it's uh, governments, but it's also private enterprises. You know, there are people who have the concession for energy in a particular location and they want to build out more capacity. They don't have offtake for it. And, you know, you don't want to partner with somebody who's going to potentially have challenges raising capital or executing. And we've proven that we are very good at raising capital. We're most likely one of the best of the publicly traded miners at raising capital. Um, we're also very good at executing in very challenging conditions. You know, the UAE site runs where the ambient temperature is over 100 degrees every single day, pretty much. And our pilot site ran there for over 100 days with no human intervention. Right? So when you can operate sites with very little human intervention, it means you can put them in places where there are very few humans. So you can put them in the hinterlands of deserts and places like that. And because the energy we consume doesn't need to be transmitted to a consumer, we can partner with people to build these renewable sites in locations where otherwise it would make no economic sense to do it. And as you look at things like geothermal energy, you can't move that energy, right? You gotta get it out of the ground where it's available. And so those are sites that we think are really interesting. And we're also looking at things like landfill gas you know the methane gas that comes out of landfills is 80 times more damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide if you can build small enough bitcoin mining site together with energy generation at the landfill site you can use that gas to create bitcoin and you can offset a lot of your energy generating costs because of the renewable energy credits you can generate and that's part of our tech stack is to be able to build these small totally automated self-contained bitcoin mining sites you can put out in the field somewhere Talk about one of the other things I think you guys are really focused on, which is chasing the non-parasitic load, right? So when, when you think about this, there's kind of the zero cost energy, you're talking about renewable credits, the, there's a bunch of different strategies as to how you kind of get here. But explain maybe the way that you all are approaching this in this pursuit of that zero cost energy and non-parasitic load. Yeah. So if you think about parasitic load is you're sitting on the grid and you're really competing with the consumer and other industries primarily other industries for energy. And so you have to curtail as a good citizen um, when the grid operator needs it. If you're sitting behind the meter, especially with a lot of renewable sites, they oftentimes have stranded energy. If you think about solar and wind, it's the top of the energy stack, meaning it's the first to be shut off and the last to be turned on. And if you think about solar, you know, it shines 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Well, if you believe in the duck curve of energy, which is kind of when energy is consumed, it looks like the bottom of a duck. The belly is 9 to 3 p.m. That's when the least amount of energy is used. So solar sites get curtailed. And that's why in places like Texas, you have negative energy pricing upwards of 20% of the time sometimes in that middle of the day. So we sit, for example, in West Texas on a large wind farm behind the meter. And when that wind farm isn't selling energy into the grid, we can consume it all. It's non-parasitic. We're not competing with the grid or consumers for that energy. And if the grid needs it, we can give it up. And so um, it's a different model than sitting on the grid where you're competing for every electron. 
as we continue to watch this uh, industry play out, it seems like people are building uh, mining equipment, mining facilities, and they're going and they're seeking out the power. Do you envision a world where people will say, no, this is actually one single uh, kind of facility. We're actually going to build from ground up, from scratch, power generation, and the facility. You're talking uh, about kind of being behind the meter and going into some of the existing renewables, but like, could someone build a wind farm specifically for Bitcoin mining and kind of integrate everything from day one, or are we still a ways away from that? Uh, the answer is yes, and it's happening today. And it's an area we're very focused on right now. Got it. And and when you think about that strategy, do you think that becomes the majority of what people do or that's just really difficult to do and only a couple of companies will be able to? So most people will just go seek out existing power generation. So, you know, most Bitcoin mining today to do it economically is done at utility scale, you know, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts, because you got to build a building or a field of containers and you got to have people there to operate it. If you're going to operate in a lot of these um, self-generating environments, methane flare gas, for example, in oil fields or uh, landfill gas or smaller solar farms, they don't generate that much energy uh, on a consistent enough basis. So you need to be able to operate these things very much as automated facility where there aren't human beings. And so you got to have the technology to do that. So I've got tons of years in the world of IoT and industrial automation. We have built our tech stack specifically for this opportunity. Our um, Next generation immersion technology will have three to four times the compute power density of existing technologies today, fully self-contained, no need for external cooling, and will enable people to really set these things up one megawatt, two megawatt, three megawatts, and operate them very hands off. So we totally see this as being one combined kind of unit. When you don't have those humans there on site, how does that change the unit economics and maybe uh, some of the insulation you have from the cyclicality of, uh, of Bitcoin, or does it not matter? You know, it doesn't change the cyclicality because at the end of the day, you know, we don't control the price of Bitcoin, we don't control global hash rate, um, and then we have halvings that happen every four years. So the goal is to lower your marginal cost to produce a Bitcoin as much as possible. And so you do that by finding the cheapest energy or ideally zero cost energy, and you do it by sucking SG&A out of your model. And so you think about these big sites, you know, a company like a riot, for example, they have hundreds of employees per site. Um, you know, we're still a company with sub 50 employees today, and yet we're arguably one of the biggest miners in the world. So our whole model is built on optimizing our SG&A and being as efficient a miner as possible. And so as we transition from being kind of this asset light miner who only work with third parties to being more of an owned and operated and moving to what we call a zero cost energy model, uh, we believe that, you know, that'll allow us to be amongst the most low cost energy uh, or low cost miners in the industry, which means that as the margins compress over time in this industry, uh, you know, it's last man standing kind of gets the last Bitcoin, right? It's um I don't do public math, but I think uh you're about forty million dollars of market cap per employee. If you kind of use a metric like that, um that yeah. that is a, a, an incredible statistic compared to most businesses, even in the tech industry. And so, um, is it something where uh those are kind of fixed costs, and let's say fifty, maybe even hundred employees is kind of you know the plateau of what you'll need, and you can scale infinitely, or is there some linear relationship between the team size and as you bring more uh, hash rate online? Now, so the <clears throat> biggest expense is obviously your executive team, your think of it, your knowledge workers, right? So the engineers, all that people. That scales to a certain level and you don't need to scale it much bigger. After that, it becomes um, what we call technicians, right, in the field. So the technicians who are the people who build the sites, get them provisioned and operating, and then manage and service them. And so if we can have sites where we have minimal unplanned downtime because we have really good predictive systems, we have really good management systems and tools for looking at what's going to break when and fixing it, plus building systems that are redundant, then that technician tier can be smaller and smaller and smaller as we continue to scale. And that's where you really get the scale. Plus, in some cases, you work with outsourced resources, which could be very low cost. And part of the attraction in the international model is there are opportunities to be at sites where between automation and the lower cost of labor, there's just no other operator that can compete. Fred, my last question for you is, if I had to ask you, uh, Bitcoin miners revenue, hash rate, and then Bitcoin price. 
five years from now? Is those three things up or down? So Bitcoin miner revenue, hash rate, and price of Bitcoin. Where do you see those three metrics five years from now? Well, they all tie so much together. So um, let's use as the point the having in 2028, right? So as, as we come into that having in 2028, uh, I think what you're going to see is the price of Bitcoin is going to be somewhere in the low six digits. You know, we're going to be 100 to 200,000, somewhere in that range, most probably, um, conservatively speaking, right? Global hash rate, close to 900, most probably. Um, and then minor revenues, um, total global revenues um, will obviously go up because the price of Bitcoin has gone up. Uh, but total Bitcoin rewards will have halved uh, almost twice by that point, right? So um, the expectation is you'll see revenues most probably close to what they are today. But the difference is there'll be a lot fewer miners. You're going to have a handful of very large miners that are global in scale, that are quasi energy companies that may even be highly diversified in what they do, not just doing Bitcoin mining, but doing other data center type operations. You know, some of our colleagues in the industry are chasing HPC opportunities, some are chasing AI opportunities. There are lots of things that you could do as a miner. Um, and then you're going to have a bunch of smaller specialist niche operators who, you know, they're particularly good at dealing with Latin American jungles and doing things in waterfalls, uh, you know, things like that. That makes uh, that makes complete sense. Where can we send people if they want to follow up with you or they want to learn more about what you all are doing? Um, so, you know, our website is mara.com, M-A-R-A.com, just like our stock symbol, easy to find. We're publishing more and more data there uh, on a regular basis. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter at F-G-T-E-L, T-H-I-E-L, and happy to answer questions and interact with people there. I always enjoyed talking to you. I learned so much. Thank you. And we'll definitely do it again in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, folks, that's it for the Bitcoin Mining Conference. I learned a ton today, and I hope you did as well. It is incredible that all these experts, all these people with years and years of experience, took the time out of their day to come and talk to me, help us understand Bitcoin mining, the companies, the technology, and the market. If you're so inclined, please go follow these people, go check out their companies, tweet at them, and thank them for their time today. I learned a lot, and I hope that you did as well. We'll do this again sometime in the future. But until then, subscribe on YouTube, go follow the podcast, go subscribe to the Pomp Letter, and I will see you all on the internet. Today's conference was brought to you by Marathon Digital Holdings. They're one of the largest, most energy efficient, and most technologically advanced Bitcoin mining companies in the world. They also are one of the largest holders of Bitcoin among publicly traded companies in North America. They differentiate themselves by investing in the most advanced technologies and leveraging innovative techniques to convert energy into economic value while helping keep Bitcoin ledgers up to date and secure one block at a time. Go check out Marathon Digital Holdings today at mara.com. Our second sponsor today for this Bitcoin mining conference was Iris Energy. They build, own, and operate data centers and electrical infrastructure to mine Bitcoin. They've been mining it using the right kind of energy since 2019 and they have introduced sustainably mined Bitcoin to the market. Their whole model is to take renewable energy to power computing infrastructure. That computing infrastructure then provides network security to support a Bitcoin mining pool, which delivers daily Bitcoin and transaction fees to the company. And then they monetize it by going from Bitcoin to cash. You can check out Iris Energy by going to irisenergy.co today. These are our sponsors and they make all of this possible. So please go check out both Iris Energy and Marathon Digital Holdings. You can visit their websites or follow the various people from their company on Twitter. Thank you to both Marathon Digital Holdings and Iris Energy.